Gotta turn my mic on. Hey everyone, uh, one of these days I'm gonna buy a manual mic control. So this happens a lot less frequent, frequently where I forget to turn my mic on, but right now I'm just using the software controls I have here on the computer. Um, so welcome to our first Lunch and Learn of the new year. Uh, we had originally scheduled to have Linda do an, like an introduction to her. She's our new executive director. However, she has been really sick for weeks. She just, I mean, we had a phone call yesterday, she just keeps coughing. So she was gonna even introduce this one and, you know, answer questions if you guys had any questions, uh, but just, you don't want her to be on here. It's very distracting. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so this was originally scheduled to be her, um, but I took this video that I had recorded in the beginning of 2021. And uh, so I had recorded it uh, in person. So I went up to Gainesville and interviewed Dr. Perez at his home. Dr. Perez is a former professor of mine when I was at the University of Florida. I took his um, environmental plant identification course and it was lovely. And so when I had a chance to visit Gainesville um, two years ago, I recorded the interview. So keep that in mind. Everything is, uh, you know, all the dates that he says how long he's been working um, was two years ago. So we have now opened up Lunch and Learns to the public. So if you are the public and you're not a member of the Florida Native Plant Society, you can join today, um, fnps.org forward slash join. Your support is really important to us. So most of our funding comes from membership dues. We are a almost completely membership-based organization. So, you know, we have 33 chapters around the state, local activities, and then we have a very small staff, three people, uh, of whom I am one, and we we need you to be a member if you can. So um, you can choose to join, um, you can have a monthly payment, you can have annual, you can become a lifetime member, which is a good deal, um, based on you know how many palmettos you get during the rest of your life. So, um, are you a member? Please become a member. And if you are a member, you can think that you are you know, helping us out by letting me continue to do this programming and we continue to have funding. And if you are already a member, um, I would like to thank everybody who donated to our annual fund drive. We had a $50,000 goal and we hit it out of the park. Uh, last time I checked, it was 52,000. And so that's the biggest one since I've been on staff. And I wanna say, I really, really, appreciate all of you. So without further ado, uh, I hope you guys enjoy. This is about a 40 minute interview. I cut it a little bit and you'll see some camera changes. His, uh, his son was young at the time and he came out and he wanted to be interviewed as well. I'm, I cut that out, but anyways, you'll see some lighting and camera changes. So I hope you guys enjoy. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, how long have you worked at UF? I've been at UF since 2006, so what's that, going on 14, almost 15 years now, yeah. So you were, you were actually, because uh, I got there in 2008. Okay. So, cool. So how long have you been doing like native plant stuff? Oh gosh, so I started working with native plants, uh, actually before I was in college, I had a landscaping business. This was back in the late 80s, early 90s. And one, back then there was a lot of water shortage problems in South Florida and xeriscaping was the big thing. So I kind of got into native plants around that time because they were promoted as being uh, water efficient plants and I was able to use them in some of the landscaping jobs that I did and I kind of kind of got turned on to them that way. So yeah, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and then I had a, a really neat internship at Fairchild Tropical Botanical Garden in the mid-90s yeah. and I worked with Dina Garvey. She was the uh, uh, curator of endangered species there and uh, I, I did a lot in the garden but that I kind of rotated through her lab twice because I really liked what we were doing there um, and that kind of just sealed the deal for me. Um, so yeah it's yeah since the Gosh, late 80s, early 90s. <laughs> so you had a landscape business in South Florida. In South Florida, yeah. yeah. And then you became, you got a degree and became a professor? Well, so, no, my path was not a straight line. Uh, gosh, I went to community college out of high school, um, and I changed my major like 500 times probably. <laughs> so I went to Palm Beach Community College and then Florida Atlantic University, 
and I ended up with a business degree. Um, but I had the landscaping business at that time, and I was thinking to myself, okay, I have this business degree, I gotta get into, into the corporate world, and um, I did, and found out really quickly that it was not for me at all. <laughs> so I had to do one of those reevaluations and kind of think about what it is I really like doing, and I like working with plants. Um, so I was thinking, oh, maybe I could get a botany degree or some other type of degree that, that uh, worked with plants, so I was going to just take some classes at the community college because they had a horticulture program. And <clears throat> I was talking to the advisor there and he said, you know, he asked me what is that I see myself doing. And I said, well, I, always, I was always interested in learning about how plants work um, and maybe doing some research. And he said, well, you know, we have a program here that's fantastic, but maybe you should really think about going up to the University of Florida. And I never thought about that at all. And he said, uh, you could, you know, you can earn a horticulture degree there um, and then see where things take you. Uh, but he said that would be that would be a good launching point for you, especially if you wanted to do research. So I, I drove up to Gainesville. My sister was going here to school here at the time, so I was able to crash with her. And I met with uh, Dennis McConnell. Um, he was the undergraduate advisor at the time. Great man. He was fantastic. And I had a long chat with him. And he said that, uh, yeah, I could come, I could... I have enough credits to transfer in, um, and I can. At that time, they had what was called a post bac degree, so it was like a, almost like a second bachelor's degree. So that enabled me to take all the plant classes uh, that I needed to to earn a horticulture degree, um, and that's kind of about the same time I did. That. Part of the curriculum was to do an internship, so I went down to Fairchild and then the internship, and that kind of started solidifying my interest in, in doing research a little bit more, learning about how plants work. Uh, I also was really involved with their seed conservation program down at Fairchild at that time. So I started developing a love for working with seeds. Uh, so I finished that, that degree and then I came back to South Florida and worked for a nursery for a, a, probably about a year, a little over a year. Uh, and still had in the back of my mind, you know, I, I wanted to do research, I wanted to kind of expand my knowledge. So I applied for grad school at, at UF and came up for a master's degree and my master's degree was focused on seed germination research for native species. I, I worked on probably a half a dozen different native species and trying to understand what makes them tick in terms of germination, if there's any dormancy present, how to overcome that dormancy. Uh, so that was a fantastic experience. Um, and as I was working through that degree program, I really found a love for teaching and really wanted to continue doing research and I was thinking, what kind of job could I get where I could blend that type of stuff? Uh, and uh, I, you know, I talked to a lot of the professors around me, and they said, you know, an academic career could be very reward rewarding. Uh, so yeah, I kind of solidified in my mind that I wanted to go on for a PhD, and I started looking around at different programs, um, and was really interested in the program at Hawaii. Uh, so you could, you could, <clears throat> there, there we had this flexibility of uh, these multi different multidisciplinary programs. Um, so I went into the horticulture program, but I have a specialization in conservation biology, ecology, and evolution, which was fantastic. So my, my academic experience in Hawaii was phenomenal because I was able to blend horticulture and conservation science and ecology, uh, work with rare plants up there, rare palm, so I got to go up to the mountains with the U.S. Army Corps uh, and the folks uh, there, and I interacted with people in the botany department and different um, uh, organizations throughout the state, and yeah, it was, it was just amazing. So, and then I got an email one day from my former major advisor, and he said, hey, you know, there's a position opening up, I'm retiring, you should think about applying for it. So I said, yeah, okay, so I applied, and. Came, came back to Florida for the interview, and um, yeah, uh, I was fortunate to, to get the job, and yeah, I've been there since 2006. Okay, tell me about your native plant research. Oh yeah, so, um, so I'm a seed biologist by training, and <clears throat> what I do is work at the intersection of seed biology and, and plant conservation. So what we do is we have three kind of main research areas. Uh, the first one is trying to understand how a changing climate influences germination dynamics. The second main research area is understanding what enables seeds to tolerate different types of stresses, abiotic stresses. And we mostly focus on things like 
uh, uh, temperature stress, so hot and cold. And there's implications of that for ex situ and in situ conservation. And we also try to understand aging stress. Um, and then the third area is looking at trying to understand why seed quality varies so much in, in seeds of wild plants, native plants. So those are the three kind of focal areas of the lab, the main research areas. And right now we have projects. I have three fantastic PhD students in the lab. Uh, I just graduated one last fall, and I also graduated a master's student last fall. Um, so for those two projects, for the students that just graduated, one of them was looking at um, trying to understand the germination niche for Linum arenicola, which is a, a endangered sand flax from South Florida. So we worked in collaboration with, with uh, uh, Fairchild Tropical Garden on that one. Um, and then my PhD student was looking at uh, Rubecchia mollis and trying to understand how seed mass may influence germination dynamics and the ability to store seeds. Um, so, uh, yeah, we've had a really good relationship with Fairchild, uh, with the Florida Wildflower Foundation as well, um, for collaborative research. So we, we kind of wrapped up those projects. There's still a lot of questions that we want to answer, so we're, we're looking to see how we can extend those questions for those two species down the road. And now currently uh, in the lab, I have uh, Tia Tyler. She's one of my PhD students. She's working with sea oats, Uniola paniculata. And that, this is a... a I love this study. Um, so we're actually looking at a continental scale latitudinal gradient. So we've been able to collect seeds from populations as far south as Bill Baggs State Park down in, in Key Biscayne, all the way up to Virginia. And then we also have a population from a plant materials introduction station in New Jersey. <laughs> so they actually did an outplanting in New Jersey uh, and uh, they've been able to collect seeds year after year. So this project is essentially looking at um, across this whole latitudinal gradient. Oh, we also collected in the west coast of Florida and out through the Panhandle, um, trying to understand how how seed vigor may change across this latitudinal gradient. So embedded in that, we're trying to understand a little bit more about dormancy and how that may or may not be apparent across the latitudinal gradient, but also trying to understand um, how seed quality and seed vigor may change across that gradient. And Tia's done a fantastic job to extend that, looking more at kind of functional trait research to try and understand how sea oats establishes and how seeds may be a part of that. Um, so we're, we're kind of getting towards the end of that project. That one's, uh, well, with everything going on right now with COVID-19, we mm -hmm. have a no-cost extension. So we're, there's still some things that we need to wrap up, um, but we're kind of, that project is starting to wind down. My other graduate student, uh, Amber Gardner, she's working with Harper Callis Flava, Harper's Beauty, which is a endemic, it's a rare species that only occurs out in the Panhandle in Apalachicola National Forest. Um, and it's a beautiful little plant. What does uh, it look like? It's, it's, it almost looks like an iris, you know? Oh, okay. um, so imagine that iris over there, but kind of shrunk down to about that tall, of vegetative growth. And then it puts out a, 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 um, a single flower. Uh, yeah, single. I think it's a single flower, um, and it's a small little star-shaped flower. It's a little monocot type plant. So kind of like a blue-eyed grass. It kind of looks like yeah, kind of, kind of, sort of like that. The flowers are bigger than a blue-eyed grass, and they're yellow. Um, it's adorable, an adorable little plant. Uh, but we started working in collaboration with U.S. Fish and Wildlife on that plant. So uh, there's some populations that occur right along Highway 65 on the right of way, and then there's some populations scattered throughout the forest. But the main drive to get that project started was um, they were looking at expanding Highway 65 to create more lanes in case there's a hurricane for to improve the uh, evacuation road. That's the only road coming in and out of that area. So they're looking to expand the roadway uh, for hurricane evacuation. But you have these endangered plants on the right of way. So they were trying to understand um, more about the seed biology of the species for conservation. So. Uh, we did some projects trying to understand um, the germination biology of it, what influences germination. There were a lot of anecdotes out there that the plants didn't produce any viable seeds, uh, but we found that not to be the case. It actually, a lot of this produces a ton of seeds that are viable and have a high germination capacity in the lab. 
Uh, we did some field studies as well, uh, but we didn't get very good establishment in the field. And we're still trying to tease that out and figure out what's going on there. But Amber's doing a fantastic job looking at uh, the potential for storing the seeds in cold storage. Um, she's doing a lot of in situ work with seed burial as well. Um, and she's also got this other kind of part of the project that's looking at uh, germinating seeds in, in vitro and trying to establish populations that way. Um, so yeah, she's done a, a fantastic job with that. So she's about kind of halfway through that project. She's been able to get funding through the FDAX program and through Jacksonville Zoo as well for that project. Um, and then my other graduate student, Terry Davidson, she just started last fall. This project is uh, not focused exclusively on, exclusively on native plants, uh, but we're trying to help local farmers and local food organizations develop um, ways to enhance seed production uh, of locally adapted crops. Uh, and trying to see if we could apply some uh, proven drying technologies to be able to store seeds from season to season. The problem in Florida is that we have high humidity and high temperatures pretty much all year long, and that's not good if you're trying to store seeds. So the key to storing seeds is keeping them dry, but that's really hard to do here in Florida because of the high humidity, unless you have real specialized facilities to do that, which are really expensive. Um, so we have these relatively low cost uh, methods that we can use to make that happen and then keep the seeds dry. So we're working with local farmers and one of them happens to be Terry Zinn from Wildflowers of Alachua. So we're working with him on um, Asclepius tuberosa. He's it's a high demand plant. It's really popular for butterfly gardening. Um, it's a beautiful plant as well. Uh, so yeah, Terry's part of that project and we're helping him uh, understand how we could better store seeds of, of uh, Asclepius tuberosa. So yeah, that's what we're kind of working on right now in terms of, of our research programs. What happened to that population on the roadside? It's still there. Okay. Um, yeah, I haven't heard any more news about them widening the road. Okay. Uh, so that population on the roadside is still there. Unfortunately, um, folks uh, at the that work for um, the forest and, um, oh gosh, what's the other organization now? Can't remember off the top of my head, but there's a couple of other scientists that have been going out and searching for, for populations, and they've been able to find a couple more kind of scattered out throughout, throughout the forest, so that's, that's a good thing. Um, so yeah, we, we work with that roadside population. Uh, we work with a population out in Ann's Bog. I don't know if you've ever been to Ann's Bog in Apalachicola National Forest. Beautiful, be beautiful site. Um, so yeah, pitcher plants, uh, all kinds of kind of boggy uh, wildflowers. When that place is on fire, uh, not in a literal sense, but in terms of flowering, mind blowing, mind blowing. And then you have all these kind of gnarled dwarf bald cypress around the edge of the bog. That just it's like are the you step into it a whole nother world. Um, so it's always we're always happy to go out into the field when we're out there working. <laughs> And also, you know, when you're coming into Highway 65, just the, when, you know, depending on the time of the year, the wildflowers just on the roadside put on quite a show. Um, so, yeah, we, that's one of our favorite spots. And we also like working with the sea oats because we get to go to the beach when we're doing our field work. So. <laughs> uh, but, yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah, that population is still there. Um, and I haven't heard any news about it going away anytime soon. So we're, we're happy about that. What would you tell, like... An, an average member who feels like ineffective in the face of like development and loss oh, of yeah. native plants and yeah well I think uh, you know it's kind of like what we've done in our yard so you know this before we planted our yard out and I you know for right from the beginning I'm, I'm gonna admit it's not 100% native we have a mix of native and, and non-native species uh, but when we moved into this property here it was it was almost you know, the, the main three plants that you see in any landscape, right? Um, so, you know, we just kind of set about going to change that and adding things in. My wife uh, has a degree in landscape architecture oh, nice. from UF, so she kind of helped, you know, she put together a design and she kind of envisioned what, what we wanted to do out here. And then, you know, slowly but surely, we've been replacing stuff and putting native plants in. Um, 
So I think that's one thing you can do, you know, is, uh, and we, you know, we, we feel pretty good about it. You know, we, we can take our son out here and sit out here and right now you hear all the birds chirping and, you know, we've seen, I don't know how many different species of birds out here, but, you know, bluebirds, we get cardinals out here. We have hummingbirds coming through right now. So, you know, being able to talk to our son about, hey, if you look at that uh, Lanacera over there, you know, you see that little hummingbird? That's why those native plants are important because the hummingbirds really depend on it. Um, or they'll come over here to the salvias and, you know, you'll see them kind of... And then just the diversity of pollinators that we see out here. We don't just see European honeybees. We get the big, chunky bumblebees and um, carpenter bees and all kinds of different stuff out here. So, you know, we could come out in the morning when it's nice and cool and just kind of do these, um, not really call them science lessons, but get him interested in seeing the connections between plants and animals and the importance of all that. And then simple things, you know, Gelsemium sempervirens, which can grow pretty much throughout the whole state, if I'm not mistaken. Um, does you know one or two plants of those that you put on a little arbor or a trellis and then when it flowers you just kind of sit down and relax next to it that can take you to another place and will take it can take us to another place <laughs> so I think I think you could start with little things like that and feel connected that way and that's I think that's totally legit, legitimate you know that's that's one way to be involved um, and then you know there's there's sometimes there's opportunities with researchers like like our group uh, to do some citizen science if you want to take it to the next level, uh, you know that kind of depends on the grant funding that we have. Um, but you know we let we've worked in partnership with Jacksonville Zoo and had their staff members come out and participate in some of the work we've done with Harper Acalis. Um, I could see I could see down the road to kind of expanding that and putting a call out to some of our local chapters. Hey, you know we're going to be doing an outplanting this day. Um, okay, so there would be an opportunity to do some citizen science with you know outplanting. Yeah, yeah, outplanting. You know, one of the one of the big bottlenecks that we encounter sometimes is actually being able to have enough hands to collect the seeds in the amount of time that we have to be out in the field. So you know, if there was a upcoming grant that we had and we incorporate that citizen science maybe there could be some training involved where we show people um, this is how this is the time that we need to go out to collect seeds this is how we do it and get them involved in that we could talk story about you know the project that we have so engage them in in that process it's, it's you know it's looking for opportunities like that that I think can help get people more engaged but I, I mean I think I think the Native Plant Society does a pretty good job of providing those types of opportunities for people so yeah, just just seeking those out and yeah, going for it. But it, it doesn't have to be anything gigantic, you know, to make a difference. It, even just talking to your neighbors and maybe sh you know sharing some cuttings with them of your favorite plant, or sharing some seeds with them and helping them get those plants established in their yards. That that could go a long way too. So yeah. Yeah, we definitely we're we've traditionally been very heavy on like the the gardening mm -hmm. aspect. Yeah. Yeah. Which I like, and I think that is like you said, some way that people can individually do something in the face of, you know, everybody with their lawns and the laws are not very helpful and, yeah. you know, the social pressure is not very helpful. It doesn't right. exactly raise your home value, except for somewhere like Gainesville, maybe. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there's all, there's different types of challenges. Um, and there's going to be, you know, restrictions, like you say, based on kind of where you live. Um, so some people are going to have the, the, kind of, I guess, the freedom to do a little bit more with their yards than in other places. Uh, but yeah, go for it. Do it. You know, I think, if, if I'm not mistaken, I think uh, some of the HOAs, I think there was some kind of guidance or regulation passed allowing HOAs more flexibility, people that live in HOAs more flexibility to um, plant native plants and do different things to their gardens. It's unfortunate that there's so many barriers that get put up in, in place. I mean, I, I, I could see both sides of the story because I was in the landscape industry a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And, I you know, my wife uh, had her business for a while up until we had our son. And, uh, I, you know, it, it's hard. Uh, being a native plant enthusiast, I, I'm for using more native plants. But at the same time, I've done jobs, I've done installations, and I've, you know, tried to sell maintenance packages and the people don't want to pay for maintenance and then you pass by the job a few months later and 
to be honest with you, it looks terrible. Yeah. It looks terrible. Yeah. So that leaves a very negative impression that's hard to erase. Yeah. Um, yeah, and I think I think sometimes that's the misconception with a lot of people in the general public that you can plant a native garden and then just leave it alone. But no maintenance. And you can't. It's yeah. No no garden is no maintenance. It or doesn't like, matter. Just stop mowing. I hear that a lot. Yeah, yeah. That's 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 a fantasy. That's a fantasy word. We have, you know, we we have to put a lot of time and effort into keeping this place from being overrun with. You know, right over here, you can see, you know, the native cherry trees. There's a couple of invasive trees over there, too, in the neighbor's property. But I, you don't know how many little black cherry seedlings I have to pull out. And um, I love our palms uh, that we have in the front yard, but I get palm seedlings coming up everywhere. And, yeah, it, it's tough. It's, it's a lot of work. It's not, it's, you know, it's not just walk away from it. And I think too, you know, trying to provide some training for maybe landscape companies too on how to work with uh, native plants that might that might be helpful as well. Yeah, we've thought about that. We used to do a lot more like CEU type stuff, mm -hmm. but we haven't been. You know, when we had our conference in Miami and uh, we had like five people show up to the CEUs, yeah. that was really tough yeah. because it's so much effort to coordinate them. Right, right, right. So we're not sure where the demand is or how we can really make an impact on industry training yeah it seems almost like a, it's almost like a niche market um, but I think there's plenty of opportunities with that right so if you look at some of the biggest niche marketers out there you know some of these high-end stores and whatnot look at how they market and what they do and focus on that niche and do a really good job <laughs> with that one area maybe I, I don't know I these are just kind of thoughts that pop into my head every once in a while implementation is a whole nother you know right you going from idea to implementation is is a lot of work but uh yeah so i mean i feel like you do a really good job in teaching people i mean like i didn't know native plants when, before i was in your class you know i was in a horticulture program even though i still didn't know the plants and from your class i only learned like i mean like 200 yeah we we yeah i tried to mix in as many native plants as i could into that class but yeah we, we just kind of barely scratched the surface to be honest with you yeah so i go up there and i i mean i know like one plant yeah in the whole thing yeah, yeah. and you have no idea how to photograph them for id purposes and it's like i understand why people are so intimidated to learn but i feel like you did quite a good job in making me feel like i could figure it out oh dang oh good 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 yeah that was the whole basis of the class is trying to give students the tools to, to figure it out, you know? So for that that type of purpose right there. So you're out in the field or you're in the nursery and you're trying to figure out what something is, you got the tools to to be able to figure it out. So, yeah, yeah. Good, uh, good, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> that it had, the class had an impact. <laughs> uh, It'd be like, we can't possibly keep this out. You know, oh, they, they would just take it back and there'd be flowers, they'd be like, oh, I don't, they wouldn't know what, family it was in and yeah there was a whole that was crazy to me well I think I think that's in terms of education <laughs> I hear that a lot from a lot of our folks in uh, governmental organizations and non-governmental organizations there's just we, we've lost that expertise that botanical expertise and it's coming around to bite people you know it's it's gone or it's very difficult to find um, yeah it's unfortunate it's it's yeah yeah so trying to see how we can create start creating this this wave of enthusiasm for having more botanical sciences from kindergarten all the way through through college and not let it go by the wayside you know one of the unfortunate things is you see across the US a lot of our botany departments have been merged with biology and our horticulture departments are kind of losing faculty to retirements and they're not being replaced and yeah, so there's going to be a, a big gap, an impending gap there, and you know what are we going to do about it? I think it's too important to to forget about it and just let it go by the wayside. So. The Florida Native Plant Society agrees. There you go, there you go. Well, and that's another way that people can get involved too. You know, uh, so how many members are there? I'm sure there's forty five hundred. Forty five hundred. Okay. Well, you know, um, that's not a small number, right? So with that power you know there can be some type of influence uh 
to suggest to our legislators that maybe they need to pay attention to things. And maybe combining with other organizations, like-minded organizations, you up that the people power in that. And it's, it's a long, slow process for sure. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, can't can't give up the fight. You gotta keep working hard at it. So right. and expect small incremental changes. Right. But at least you know, trying to have, make a positive impact. So yeah, it'd be nice if there was more funding at the national and state level for this type of stuff. Um, you know, when we have our, our uh, some of our grants that involve working with native species, thinking about having some kind of educational component to it. Um, where we work with K through 12 teachers and teach kids about native plants and yeah, I mean there's ways to do it. You know, I've 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 known about the Native Plant Society since the late 80s and I really have to applaud you guys for what you guys are doing. You know, it's I know your budgets are not huge, but you still find a way to put out conservation grants and research grants. And when you look across the country um, at other states that have native plant societies they don't have those mechanisms in place so um yeah i know maybe california and some other states but go to some other other states just in the southeast and they don't even have a native plant society <laughs> so um yeah it, it's it's tough there's no doubt about it uh, but i think what 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 the native plant society is doing with its grants programs is is is, is worthy of of recognition and there's been a lot of good work that's been done over the years uh, but it's yeah it's tough it's tough when when there's not a big pile of money <laughs> that people can work with so yeah yeah Wait, money talks money it makes things easier yeah. in terms of getting your goals and objectives met um, and then starting new initiatives right so yeah <laughs> that's pretty great is, is there anything else you'd like to to add? Uh, no, I think I think just keeping that enthusiasm alive for for native plants uh, with our young people. Um, I think that's going to be one of the important things moving forward. So if you're thinking about education, uh, maybe talking to folks like the Florida Wildflower Society. I think they had some. Um, I think they created some. Uh, I want to say some kind of like coloring book, wildflower coloring book that they were able to put into the public schools. And so stuff like that, yeah, trying to really get in touch with, with teachers, um, thinking about your education programs through the lens of the Florida education standards would be really helpful because then you're making the teachers work a lot easier. <laughs> uh, but you know, that, that takes partnering with folks that really understand the standards and really understand what teachers are doing to kind of come up with those types of programs. But there's probably larger granting opportunities through like Department of Education, so federal grants that the Native Plant Society might want to go after, okay. to and leverage that against the the, the resources that you do have. Um, so yeah, you know, um, trying to trying to reach those younger generations, I think would be really important, um, and I think it's doable. It's achievable. It's a it's a long, hard task. There's no doubt about it. Uh, you have to talk realistically. Uh, but it's it's worthy. I think you know. Anytime I see kids around plants um, that we have here in the garden, the wildflowers, or you take them out to Terry Zinn's wildflower farm and let them experience what he's got going on out there, I mean their minds are blown. So there's all kinds of education embedded in native plants. It's not just biology. It's math. It's art. It's history. Um, it's it's the opportunities there are just amazing. I think so. Yeah, I think. Uh, Trying to get our younger folks more involved would be something to think about, yeah, more. I, I'm sure people are thinking about it, but, you know, being able to actually implement that. Before I forget, <laughs> what is your favorite plant? My favorite plant? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> you know, I really, I really love dogwoods. Yeah, the trees. Um, we used to have a gigantic one next to the driveway. Uh, so when we, that was one of the first things that caught our eye when we bought this house was they had this beautiful gigantic dogwood and it was flowering and when Kelly and I passed by we were like, oh god, that's, that's so wonderful. Um, so we had it there for, for several years and then I think it, it, there was some kind of, it got some kind of fungal disease I think and, and it slowly started 
just dying. And I had to, I unfortunately had to cut it down a couple of years ago. Um, but yeah, I just love that. I love red buds too. Yeah. Um, and then the, uh, which, which was, oh, it's called, uh, can't remember the scientific name off the top of my head, but the Mayhaws. Uh, oh yeah, Crataegus. Crataegus, thank yeah. you. The scent on those yeah. and the scent with it, we have a Gelsimium right there. When that thing is in flower, mm. I just, I love the, the scent of that. Um, yeah, uh, I love the, rube I love a lot of the wildflowers too. Um, yeah, I just name one favorite plant. Wow, you. <laughs> we started tough. with like end of range trees, bottom yeah, yeah, of range trees. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. yeah kind of a thing yeah yeah so um i've always had this vision in my head of uh, a landscape design that incorporates you know uh, red buds near uh dogwood and you have red maples in the background so I, I don't know what the design would look like i know there's architect landscape architects out there that can pull something amazing off but using those three trees with the with the chickasaw plum mixing those somehow in layers or something like that because they all kind of tend to flower around the same time so you have this progression of color and i think that would be mind-blowing um i'm just waiting for someone to, to pull it together and say hey we did this and be like oh yeah it's cool go check it out <laughs>